forced in this time of grief to also try to be an activist or an advocate or something to get what they say will be justice. Speaking to her community and to the nation with all eyes on her under this threat, talking about, quote, burying her son. It's difficult. And then there's the other legal process playing out, and they're interrelated as we've reported because this new incident was brought up in the Chauvin trial 10 miles away. Today, the news is the defense rested. They've done three weeks total. Derek Chauvin has formally invoked Fifth Amendment rights. That means no one can make him testify under oath on the stand about what he's accused of or in his own defense. And there was really a riveting moment when you think about how much has been said about Chauvin since the killing of George Floyd, since the video went around the world, and now in this recent trial. We have this moment now we can report for you where Chauvin actually spoke. Now, to be clear legally, I want you to understand the jury is not in the room for this, so you're going to see more than really the jury would as a viewer, as a citizen of this country, because it's open court to everyone but the jury for reasons of independence. We heard from Chauvin. Is this your decision not to testify? It is not. All right. Do you have any questions about your right to remain silent or to testify in your own behalf? Not at this time, I don't. And has anyone uh, promised anything or threatened you in any way to keep you from testifying? No promises or threats, Your Honor. Do you feel that your decision not to testify is a voluntary one on your behalf? Yes, it is. That was the confirmation of that decision under that process. The closing arguments are expected to begin on Monday. For our coverage here on this trial and these issues, we're joined by NYU law professor Melissa Murray and Emily Bazelon, a legal writer for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, professor Murray, we wanted to highlight that important moment, as I mentioned, for uh, citizens, not the jury. Uh, what everyone thinks, and people can make up their own minds, uh, what everyone thinks of this defendant, uh, this defendant in our system has these rights, and there is this moment there in a trial like this. Walk us through what we saw there uh, and why it matters. So each criminal defendant, all of us really, have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And in order to invoke that right, you do so in open court. And the colloquy between Officer Chauvin and the judge was basically to discern whether or not his invocation of his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination was voluntarily given to make sure that it wasn't done in exchange for anything, that he basically understood what he was giving up and he was waiving his opportunity to testify on his own behalf, and it was done freely and knowingly. Yeah, and that brings us to the strategic decision, Emily. Uh, this has been a trial we've covered where there has been a great deal of powerful evidence against Mr. Chauvin as a defendant, uh, and, I, and I've covered, and I think folks have seen, how much humanizing evidence there's been uh, about Mr. Floyd, which is to say, at times, they didn't even cross-examine the witnesses in the so-called spark of life and other uh, rationales under state law, where basically you learn about who this person was as a human. Um, with all that in mind, what do you think of the decision here by the defense not to put him on the stand, not to uh, take what would have been their turn to potentially humanize him, but also expose him to great vulnerability? Right. I mean, this is often the hardest decision that defendants and their lawyers have to make, because if you're saying it's your chance to explain yourself, and I think even though we all have a Fifth Amendment right not to testify, and it's really important to remember that that does not imply guilt, it's natural for jurors to wonder about this person as a human being. And so you're sort of giving up that chance. On the other hand, it can be a real wild card to testify. And so I think it is really common for um, defendants and defense lawyers to feel like the safest course is just not to say anything. And so I think that's what we saw happen today. Professor, your view on the decision? Again, I said from the beginning, the biggest issue in this defense going forward is whether or not Mr. Chauvin would take the stand to try and bring his own perspective as to what happened on May 25th into the courtroom. But again, as Emily suggests, testifying in his own defense opened the door to a range of other issues that the prosecution could have brought in on cross-examination, including his prior misconduct incidences that were in his employment file. So that would have been available to the prosecution to pursue as well, and that could have been incredibly damaging. But again, he had a right to invoke the Fifth Amendment. He took that right. He is not implying that he is guilty. The jurors aren't there. They will be instructed that his invocation of the Fifth Amendment is not an indication of his guilt. It's simply an invocation of a constitutional right. Yeah. Now, I don't always do this, but Emily, can I tell you what I think of this uh, strategic decision? Please. You know, 
sometimes I just anchor. Um, but looking at this as a lawyer, I would have started the trial thinking you don't put him on the stand for the, for the, for the sound reasons that the professor just reminded us. It seems to me at this juncture, uh, they're in such a hole um, that so much video has shown and so many experts have shown Mr. Chauvin to be making mistakes on the job. Again, I'm not saying whether he com uh, committed murder or not. The jury will decide that. But, but making such egregious mistakes on the job that it would seem to me, and I'm curious your response, Emily, that they're in such a hole that while they would risk the other negative stuff coming in, getting him as a human being, if he's able to, to try to make the case, whatever his defense would be, um, that he feels bad, um, that he may have made a mistake, but he didn't intentionally or ma with malice of forth by trying to murder someone. Getting that defense in front of the jury when they're in this hole might sway one or two jurors with, with, with regard to doubt about the murder charges, because without him saying much, there was a lot of strong evidence, Emily, that really depicted him, uh, and again, I'm quoting the evidence, as, as quite depraved, and really just the video that played for these jurors it, it, it gets harder and harder for the jurors to see him as a human being who may have made a mistake rather than, uh, which is their defense, rather than what the forces that emerged, Emily. Right. I mean, the video is incredibly compelling evidence. I'm not sure the jurors can or should see beyond that. You could see at the beginning of the trial a chance that the medical case the defense was trying to make, oh, Mr. Floyd contributed to his own death, there were drugs in the system, these explanations might sway jurors. It seemed to me from what I watched the testimony that the prosecution's witnesses were much stronger on those fronts. And so I take your point, Ari, that at this point, it's sort of like a Hail Mary pass, really. And maybe um, what you're talking about would convince a juror or two, which is all it takes on the murder charges. I'm not sure it would work on the manslaughter charge, which doesn't require the kind of depravity you were talking about. But maybe that's the case on the murder charge, then obviously that would be worth something. So 